Hey, this is Dominic, and this is your home for the cutting edge conversations on optimizing your personal performance, lighting up your sex life, and living a purpose driven life of your own design. These are the topics that Dominic and I have both struggled with in our own lives and still don't always get right. This is Brian. Welcome to the Great Man Podcast. What might you be able to learn about elevating your sex life from a woman who's coached over 1,000 men in the last 15 years? Well, stick around for the next 60 minutes with our guest, Shana James, and you'll find out. Shane is here to share her wisdom of how you can have a next level sex life by passing through the gateways of deeper connection and intimacy with your partner. So who is Shana James? Shana is a coach for men focusing on the areas of love, leadership, and legacy. But as you'll hear her talk about on the show, the vast majority of men come to her for relationship, intimacy, and sex guidance. She runs the Man Alive podcast, which she's been doing for four or five years now. She's had some pretty impressive guests on the show, like Dr. John Gottman, who is the author of the legendary book, The Seven Principles for Making Marriage Work. If you don't know about Dr. John Gottman, he developed this process that with 92 or 93% accuracy can detect the survivorship of a marriage based on witnessing only like five or 10 minutes of a couple arguing. Like he can determine 92 or 93% accuracy, whether that couple will be divorced or together in like the next year. So it's, it's really profound stuff. She's interviewed him on the show. She's had some episodes of interest, like what makes a woman trust you reimagining men's sexuality and an episode that we dig into on today's show called impotence could be the best thing that ever happened to you. We had a fascinating discussion about some of the highlights from that episode. She also has this TEDx talk called What 1,000 Men's Tears Reveal. You got to check that out. So in today's episode, she's unpacking the sex and relationship insights from 1,000 male clients over the last 15 years. This is mostly from a heterosexual perspective, but some of the stuff that we do have here can certainly apply to same-sex relationships. She talks about the two areas where men abdicate leadership in the bedroom and, of course, how to change that. We talk about why men need to have and lead better conversations about sex with our partners outside the bedroom. So in essence, talking about sex when we are not turned on, how men can wake up new parts of our bodies to expand our erogenous zones outside of the typical groin region. And we explore having the mindset of what if there were no problems in the bedroom, right? Like what if losing an erection wasn't a problem? What if your feminine partner having an emotional interruption, quote unquote, in the bedroom is not a problem, but actually gateways to more play, deeper intimacy, connection, discovering new pathways of sexual arousal. Enjoy today's liberating, funny, and insightful conversation with Shana James, next level sex talk for the mature man. Shano, as we were talking about before we started recording, you know, we've had some tremendous success with women who have come on the show who run communities of women that they coach to give us all sorts of insights on how to interact with women. This is the first time that we've had a coach who's a woman who has built her entire career around supporting men. And you run a podcast that exclusively is dedicated to supporting men. So this is going to be an awesome conversation. Brian is sad that he's unable to join us here today, but he's he said he's going to be our first listener nice. to this episode. <laughs> so welcome to the show, Shana. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's awesome to have you here. And maybe just to set the context, who are the men that you work with? Because I know you said over the past 15 years, there's been over a thousand leaders, businessmen, you know, people in relationships that you've helped to work with. Who are the men that you support? Well, I would say most men come to me when they are struggling in some way romantically. That could be single and they don't want to be. Oftentimes it's men after divorce, you know, going through that getting back out there phase. And there are also men who come to me in a relationship, in a romantic relationship, a marriage, a long-term relationship, feeling like the spark has faded, more of a roommate situation. And men, some men come to me for business and leadership and legacy 
but I would say most of them come romantically and then we work on all of it because it's all connected. It's all connected. Yeah, for sure it is. And do you have a particular understanding why they come to you more for the romantic stuff than the, let's say the legacy or leadership stuff? I don't know. My sense is that maybe there's more turning to men for the leadership piece or the legacy piece. And there's also sometimes turning to men for relationship coaching, but I think I do bring a unique perspective of, okay, let's get real. Let's get honest. Let's practice. Let's play with some of these things. And you know, whereas when you're working with men, there are really powerful pieces around truth and vulnerability and not feeling alone and all of that. And then I think with me, it's more like, okay, now let's play with some of that and see, because sometimes as you try to bring that to a woman, you realize, oh my God, this is a whole nother ball of wax. And now I'm triggered or frozen or stuck in these ways. And so I think that's when men tend to come to me. Mm, As I was listening to your answer where you said, it seems like men may go to other men for leadership and legacy. I felt that there's some truth to that. And I also know that I've been speaking to men about, hey, like there are uh, tremendous coaches who are women who can also provide exceptional guidance around leadership and business. And and I think we're shortchanging ourselves by not looking. I was just having a conversation with a man I respect the other day who said that like over the past year or two, he's made it a point to hire women coaches that help him with business and other things. As you said that more men come to you romantically. I know from my own lived experience, I feel like a lot of men have trouble being vulnerable with other men when it comes to relationship issues and oftentimes seek the non-judgment, seek the, I don't want to say blanket, but like softer Softer. hand. Yeah. Right. That's certainly not the case for all women, but we've had conversations before where I I feel that tenderness with you. Mm. What have you seen with these, in many cases, powerful men? Because I know that a number of the men who come to you are guys who are CEOs, Mm -hmm. guys who are making seven Mm -hmm. figure incomes. What have you seen in terms of the armor coming off with these guys and and in the opening up to you? It's so beautiful and touching to me, you know, to be going through the midst of a conversation where a man says something that I feel the vulnerability of, and he just kind of glides through and glosses over. Hmm. And then I say, hold on, can we go back to that moment? And where suddenly the guards get to come down and it's safe enough for a man to feel his feelings or to feel the fear or to you know, just admit that he doesn't have it all together. And I've heard many men say like, well, there's enough women around and we've been raised by women and single women and we don't need any more women anymore. And, you know, there's men's groups happening and I'm a huge support of men's groups. I would never say like, come to me and don't go join a men's group or don't get support from a man. I think there's just different phases in people's lives where it's either, oh, you know, I want some of that softness, that tenderness from a woman or I want to actually resolve some of the older wounds that happened with women. You know, some of the first relationship dynamics, some of the mother dynamics, some of the ex wife dynamics. You know, those things happen, they get healed in relationship. And it doesn't have to be in your romantic relationship, it can just be in a healing relationship with another person. So, you know, I was thinking about a guy who came to me and we were doing work together for a long time. And then one day he said, I want to tell you about this experience I had when I was little that left me feeling there's this shadow of somehow like I'm perverted for his whole life. We talked about it and and actually it was this one moment that it unraveled really quickly where I said to him, oh, okay, that's interesting. So you're saying perverted as though it's a bad thing. Like a pervert is bad. And he just cracked up and started laughing. And I started laughing and we both just had this moment of realizing oh, we have these ideas that we hold about ourselves and then we, you know, make meaning of them. Like having perversions is somehow bad. You know, there's something incredible and exciting and interesting and unique about each of our perversions. And, you know, so that happened with him when he was really young with a young girl at the time. And so the fact that we got to heal it together as two mature adults, a man and a woman, then allows him to have more freedom and go back to his other relationships in that freer way. Are you able to share what the act was that he labeled as a perversion? Because I think that would help bring some additional color to the situation. 
Yeah, I don't want to get too far into it because, it, you know, the confidentiality, but I would say there was an attraction to someone who it seemed forbidden or, you know, the people around him said it was forbidden. And then the idea got into his head that because he had that attraction, there was something wrong with him. There was something bad about him. Yep. I see that. I mean, part of my history is I, I went through Sex Addicts Anonymous for a period of four years and I had a chance to witness so many men in the rooms, when I say rooms, the 12-step recovery rooms, who had similar things where you know something from a very early age was labeled as bad or wrong, and then it became either a labeled perversion, uh-huh. or there's something broken with me, or there's something wrong with me that then creates issues in the bedroom. I know a man who said, when he was a teenager, he inadvertently walked into his parents' bedroom mm-hmm. while they were having sex, and they shamed him for that. They punished him. They shamed him. He was just like, you know, uh, he just- Innocent, just, right? There's innocent, innocent right? there, yeah. Yep. And then the the sexual position that he witnessed that they were in is now a position that he cannot engage in sexually. Like he loses his erection because of that, like that moment. And he's carried that three decades, Yes. right? 30 years. So these are the things that are so important that people like you are helping to, to provide like safety in, in, in environments where that can be healed. Yeah, I want to like start really sinking our teeth into this topic that you brought today about how men can have affection, communication, and a mind-blowing sex life. And we're going to get into that in a moment. But I think one other really interesting thing that you do, Shana, is for the past four or five years, you've been running a podcast called The Man Alive Podcast. And again, it's for men and you interview mostly men. Why did you choose to go down that path of launching a podcast that's specifically for men? Well, it started after I was already working mainly with men. So, you know, 15 or 20 years ago when I started coaching, I thought I was going to work with women and then had an opportunity to support men and was completely blown away by what could happen between men and women and the healing that was possible. And so when I started the Man Alive podcast, it was when I was really, I had a workshop business for women years ago and taught women all about, you know, authenticity and and how to have relationships and great sex lives while being true to themselves. And, but I had shifted into working with men and then really realized that there are fewer resources. I think it's, you know, more and more are available, but I think there are fewer resources for men to learn about the whole range of everything from sex to leadership, to love legacy and all of that. So I just felt excited to have these conversations that I think are more rare and that men can listen to on their own, I know that it's a little less of a group thing often <laughs> right. than with women. And so, you know, to listen to a podcast in your car or when you're out taking a run or, you know, waking up in the morning. So that felt exciting to me. Yeah, you're so right with that. Guys start with the books and the podcasts and they're on that track for years. And I'm like, I'm browbeating our listeners all the time. I'm like, hey, it's great that you're on that path, yes. but like personal development In isolation, it's slow, it's shallow, it's incomplete. Like, come on out, show your faces, do the work with the other guys. And on the Man Alive podcast, you've had some great guests. You know, like Ben Greenfield. I know if if you're if you're into biohacking, he's he's an exceptional guest to have. John Gottman, his book is The Seven Habits or Seven Principles of a Highly Effective Marriage. Yeah, he's. I mean, he's got tons of them. There's another one, Principles About Love. He has a book called Eight Dates, which is really about creating relationships based on a foundation of, you know, really knowing each other. So yeah, he's got incredible books out there. And he and his wife, Julie, have done studies around, they study couples and they have this laboratory, like an apartment and they study couples' heart rates and they study, you know, as they're having arguments and who recovers and who doesn't, they predict who gets divorced and who doesn't based on how people argue. They're they're really amazing. Yeah. that It's all fascinating stuff. And I think that his like, success rate with predicting divorce within like a one year period of time is like 92% accurate yeah, based somewhere. on how they argue. Yeah. Yes, yes. And so the seven principles are based on kind of like how to do arguments better and, and other things. And there was this one episode that you did, Shana, that I, I have to ask you about where you brought in a couple of guests that the title of the episode was something along the lines of how impotence may actually save your sex life. Something along those lines. What the hell was that conversation about? <laughs> that was a beautiful conversation with a man who had gone through some kind of, I think it was prostate cancer, mm. and he lost his capacity to have an erection. Mm. And he and his partner have 
found and created incredible and beautiful ways to be sexual and to be intimate and to have a love life where they actually feel as satisfied or even more satisfied than with, you know, what we would call like a traditional sex life. So that was an incredible episode. And I have always had this sense that I want to help men expand your definition of what sex is and orgasm is and all of that, because I think when we're so focused on genital penetration and that's the end goal and, you know, we've got a climax and that's where we have to get to that, that actually really limits the pleasure and the intimacy that's possible. And for me, that was an exciting episode to bring up some of those pieces and the worst fear that men tend to have and really right. call that out and be like, Hey, this doesn't actually have to be the end. It could get even better after that. That's fascinating. And so he lost his ability to have an erection permanently. Permanently this wasn't, is what right. it seems like. Yeah. That would be pretty much most men's worst nightmare, like yes. dick falling off or the no erections ever again. And what you're saying is that he was able to share in a story and go through a journey with his partner where they're not only having sex, but it's mind blowing, heart connected, next level. Exactly. So since we are already here on the topic of sex, right? I mean, you, you proposed this conversation about affection, connection, mind-blowing sex. Let's start in the place that every guy would want to anyway, yeah. which is this the, the sex part, sex. right? <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I ran a poll, a survey on my Instagram feed a few weeks ago that was really illuminating for me. And it was, it was a poll talking to women about what happened when their male partner lost an erection. And it was fascinating. I have I have the survey results somewhere, but I also asked them for you know commentary on what happened. Did that situation make you feel a certain way? Mm-hmm. If he lost his erection, did sex end? You know what was said to each other, mm-hmm. and there was such a spectrum. I probably had a hundred responses, like written responses from women, that ranged from her feeling like there was some, something. It was an wrong indictment with her. on her. Yep. Yep. Right. Yep. Like, and so it was an indictment on her attractiveness. And so she shut down or, you know, got angry at him or something. That's so interesting. First of all, I think there is a way that the shame happens where we all think it's our own fault. Mm-hmm. And then mm-hmm. the different reactions, right? Someone either getting angry or shutting down and feeling that, you know, that shame spiral of going inward and feeling really sad and all of that. So it's just so interesting how we all have these different responses. Right. We always make it about ourselves when it's like, you know, And I know when that's happened with me before, like the shame kicks in immediately Yeah, and it's really hard. It's really difficult. I guess I should use the word. (laughs) It's really, (laughs) it's really difficult to maintain your footing. Like when you're in that situation, you're feeling shame. I feel the flush in my face Mm -hmm. and also to hold her emotions when she's, when she's processing it as it's her fault or there's something wrong with her. Not an ideal time for both people to have their feelings. (laughs) Right. And, And one of the things I found fascinating was how many women who responded saying, well, it was the first time it had happened to me. Wow. And I was like, oh, like, it's interesting that her processing was that to his me, losing his erection was her. happening to you. Interesting. Yeah. Yep. What would you have to say about something like that? Well, as I've dated in my 40s, because I was divorced in my late 30s, it's a really a regular occurrence and it had been a regular occurrence. I'm now in a more longer term relationship, but When I was dating, it just seemed like a regular thing that many men in the beginning would, I was going to say again, hard, would have a hard time, would (laughs) would not be as fast to have an erection. And it started making sense to me in terms of safety. And what I see as I'm coaching men now in their 40s and 50s and sometimes 60s is that there's so much more of an emotional component to the physicality. And so a lot of men as they get older, tend to need some more intimacy, connection to feel seen or heard or understood, even though that has typically been seen as some kind of feminine quality. So I don't know, I have so much base and compassion for it. And also to me, because, and if you can, you know, expand your definition of sex beyond he has to be hard and she has to be wet, or, you know, we've got to have penetration here your whole body is an erogenous zone. You know, your whole like energetic body is an erogenous zone. There are so many ways to play and to experience each other. So I think a woman who responds in a negative way, you know, it's just her own fear and her own shame. And ideally 
two people can come together and be vulnerable and supportive and compassionate as opposed to getting stuck in their own shame about it. Right on. And you know, your your insight about how men in their 40s and 50s may need more of an emotional, intimate connection before the turn on fully, fully lights up. Yeah. Is so important for men to know because like that is exactly the journey that I went on. I mean, when I was 20, like just the like, you know, the wind blowing. Right. Like I'm I'm ready to go. <laughs> and you know, my teenage years, my 20s and my 30s, like the the issue was not popping off too quick. Right. And then in like my late 30s and my 40s, what I started to notice was like there was a slower start. It wasn't because something was broken. Mm -hmm. It was because something required more intimacy. Exactly. Right? It opens up this whole new realm of connection and intimacy and passion and pleasure that it seems at first like, oh, this is going to be a hassle or this sucks. And actually, it's quite amazing. So let's get into, and you said this a couple of times, Shane, about you know, the whole body's an erogenous zone. Let's look so much further beyond just like the penetrative sex yeah. as the default form. So we're talking about men of any age, you mm-hmm. know, if like, if, if your dick is working a hundred percent or if it's, you know, if, if it's not always as reliable, yeah. like any guy can benefit from this conversation of expanding the erogenous zone. So if I were coming to you kind of just like hat in hand and saying, all I've been doing my whole life is, is really kind of looking at that penetration, that penetrative sex. Yeah. How would you open me up to all the other realms that are available? Oh, such a beautiful question. How do I open you up to the other realms that are available? I think, well, first I would talk about or kind of have you start to check in with your own body in terms of energetic presence, right? And so you can even take your own two hands and, you know, touch your own two hands together and then notice, like, is there any energy coming out of my fingers, you know, toward the other? Is there any, when you touch someone, your energetic lines are actually connected to your heart. And so I can feel sometimes energy pouring from my heart through my arm and my fingers into someone else's body, right? You can have all kinds of spark and aliveness come through your hands when you're actually present to the energy that's there and also to your own body and your own sensations. And so one of the things I think we have to do is start to wake up our bodies. And I often have men start to feel their toes and you can put your attention on your toes right now, right? Like, were you even aware that they were there before I said it? And now that you're feeling them, can you feel all 10 of them just by sensing them? And if you can't, you can wiggle them around and, you know, start to feel like, oh, I just noticed, you know, there's a little bit of cold between my big toe and my second toe. And then in the arch of my foot, I can feel where it's on my leg and there's temperature and there's pressure. And so the more you become awake to all of the sensations in your body, the more pleasure you get to have. And we are like tuning forks. And so actually what a lot of men who come to me find is that as they start to wake up their bodies, the women in their lives, if they're in a relationship with a woman, their bodies actually start to wake up as well. Yeah. And that's so big because, I mean, if you watch porn, especially with men, it comes to like the man's pleasure, it's just like right to his dick. Yeah. Like there's no other parts of the body that are stimulated. And, yeah. and for me, you know, that was kind of like, I like my neck kissed and then, uh-huh. and then everything was like, okay, then, and then let's move on. Like, let's, let's go down here. Right. <laughs> and, a, and, 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 right. And, and, you know, I'm, I want to be pretty vulnerable here. Cause like, I, I think it could be helpful just to even kind of talk through some of the stuff that I know I've dealt with. Like I'd shut off anal play for like my entire life. Cause like, I think there was some, like there was some story that I grew up in, in the generation where as a straight man, you were ridiculed if you did anything gay, yeah. right? It was the that's gay generation. We've had conversations about that on this podcast before, and we're we're working on unraveling that. But I I know that anything that was around my ass region, mm-hmm. it was like no, so that's a one way street. Yeah. yeah, off limits. Yeah, until like a recent partner started to kind of laugh at me, look at me like I'm totally outdated, you know, and just right. like loosen up, old guy. Loosen up, buddy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And it's been a work in progress because there is still some of that, like that, that restrict the, the constriction. Yeah. And how do you teach men who may have restrictions around, you know, any parts of mm-hmm. like that, that erogenous awareness? Yeah. How do we start to open up? Well, I either teach men to, you know, explore by themselves or if they have a partner or someone to explore with to really slow it down. 
when you start to slow down and you actually get a sense of what do I feel? What do I like? What do I want? And there's a way of separating it from just the genitals being the place of pleasure, right? My partner was rubbing my head the other night and I was like, God, I wish people knew that head sex was available because in some moments that feels as amazing to me as genital penetration, you know, because actually I've trained my body to experience pleasure in all zones or, you know, in all parts of my body. And so I think a lot of men have a sense, well, that's something that women can do and maybe we are less sensitive, but you really can, if you slow down, start to train your body to feel more and more sensation. So you would say that that's a false belief that men have? Because like I, I would fall into that camp of, oh, well, well, women are more sensitive to the touch in all the different parts. You would say that from your experience that you've seen that we have the capacity to do the same thing as we train ourselves. Yeah. And that some of it has to do with knowing what you like and some of it has to do with being willing to feel even agitation and things that you don't like, right? Instead of cutting that off, getting more of a sense of what does that feel like inside my body versus, oh, I just don't like it. So this is fascinating because it's it's basically being open to feelings that I wouldn't categorize as sexual. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Exactly. Right? So you almost have to go kind of off the path of what you traditionally experience as sexual. Identify as sexual. That's a great way to say it. Huh. Interesting. And the thing that you said before about like slowing it down, mm -hmm. if there's one complaint I hear from women about men more often than any other is like, it's too fast. It's, it's too, too fast. hard. It's not, mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And one of our guests, uh, actually I was a guest on her show. Her name is Lila. Uh, she runs the horizontal with a Lila show. It's a great show. Nice. She said, I want it slower than slow uh -huh. and then slower than that. Wow. Right. Yeah. And, and I remember that being like, okay, that, that was fascinating. And I think one of the fears, Shana, that I know I would have personally mm -hmm. about going so slow mm -hmm is I may lose my erection. Your erection, right. Right? Okay, if we're not moving at this pace where like the energy is like all this, yes. that the erection starts to go. And and it's less about, I guess, partially about losing the erection, but then it's- Will the connection- Well, it's actually more about like, then there's the moment where like she calls for the dick. Uh -huh. and, and you know what I mean? She goes- And okay, you're not no, ready in that way. And you're not ready. And, yeah. that, and, that, and that's, that's like a terrible feeling to wow. have. Wow, yeah. So if you're saying, let's slow it down, let's do all of this- mm -hmm. What happens when she goes, now I'm ready? Well, first of all, the thing I was going to say is there's an idea that as you start going slower, there's less sensation. But when you actually start to feel more and more subtlety, you can feel more sensation, right? The ancient, the Taoist teachings of feeling the energy flow moving through your body, right? You can start to sense your blood flowing in your body. You can start to sense, you know, muscles opening and contracting. And so as you start to practice more, there really is still a lot of sensation. And okay, say that moment comes when she's ready and you're not hard. It's that old shame pattern that would tell you there's something wrong here in this moment. I'm not able to meet her and therefore... She's going to think I'm unmanly or she's going to leave or she's going to write something as opposed to, oh, here's a moment where we get to get creative and we get to play right. and we get to explore and see either A, what else could happen in this moment or B, what do I need to get hard? Right. So a part of that is her being ready to play that game. Or if, if we're talking about in, in same sex couples, like both partners being ready to play that game. For me, I think the thing that would that would be incumbent upon me before going into that, say, uh -huh. that space where we're going to slow it down is to say, I can't wait to do this. Like I'm excited to go into the space and a fear I have is. Yeah. A lot of couples are not talking about sex outside of the bedroom. And it's really powerful when you start to have those conversations. Here are some of my fears or here's how I would love to play with you. I want to go in and out of slow and fast and passionate and primal and then like, you know, loving and soft and gentle. And what if nothing was a problem, right? What if anything and everything that showed up was something that we could play with and explore and get creative with and have more kinds of passion and pleasure than we've even realized? Well, so what you just said about like nothing is a problem mm -hmm. is so profound yeah. because, you know, the, those two words, 
that really crush a guy, and we're speaking from the guy's perspective in this in this case, is the what's wrong. Yeah. And we know that in, in doing again that poll with the women around, you know, when a man's lost his erection, I, I said, here's one message that the guys in my community want you to know is when this happens, avoid these two words, which uh-huh. is what's wrong. Uh-huh. And so many of the women wrote back, were like, holy shit, that is my reaction. Such like there's something insight. wrong. Right. Yeah. And there were there were a few women, I would say like, you know, maybe three percent of the women who responded who were like, Oh, I loved on his soft cock the same way I would his hard one. Yeah. And sometimes it comes back. Other times we move on to everything else. Right. And if nothing's a problem, then what new realms of connection and intimacy exactly. are available, right? Right. What if the bedroom becomes more like a playground as opposed to this test, <laughs> science like some test perform- that we're supposed yeah. to perform in, so some play yeah. that we're supposed to enact and it's supposed to go a certain way. You know, those are those mind-blowing moments when you're like, oh, I've been living inside of this box my whole life and suddenly you open the box and you can see the sky and it's like, there's so many other ways to play. And we do have those old triggers and those old shame patterns and the meaning that we made of things when we were young, like we were saying before. And so sometimes it does take a little bit of support to work through some of those. Love this. Let's talk about like leadership in the bedroom, Mm -hmm. right? What are some of the ways that men are abdicating leadership in the bedroom? And what are ways that like you, you have guided men to step up and take a firmer hand with consciousness and attunement to their partner? Yeah. One of the things I'm thinking about is when a woman seems less interested or, you know, you're, you're going along, you're making love or you're kissing or whatever's happening. And suddenly there's a, there's a lag in energy. Yeah. You can feel that drop. One of the ways I see men abdicate leadership is just trying to keep going. Like just, okay, well, if we, if we go faster, if we push through this, then maybe it'll come back Mm -hmm. versus the beauty of checking in with her to see, oh, something just shifted. Mm -hmm. Is there something different that you want? Did something happen? I remember I've talked about this story on another podcast where I was making love with my partner and he looked at me at one point and he was like, something's happening. You're not really here, are you? And it turned out I had actually been to a funeral that day and I was still processing all of this grief and sadness and he just made space for that. And without attachment that we are going to get back to this, you know, this moment of sex, there wasn't a scarcity around it. And so he really invited me to just feel and cry and express whatever I needed to. And then it got really hot and passionate between Mm. us because I was then fully there in all of the messiness and the wetness and the feelings. Sometimes that's what it takes actually for a woman to really be fully open in her body. I would say if you're trying to push away and get back to happy so that sex can happen, yeah, then that really cuts off a big range of the spectrum and really often has women a little more kind of more rigid or smaller zone of pleasure. Right. Yeah. If you keep bulldozing past it. And would you say that the sex that you were having in some respect opened you up to feeling those emotions from the funeral? Yes. And again, if there's no problem, it's like, wow, how beautiful is that? That we started having sex, that then it opened up my sense of what was really going on with me that I was protecting against And how beautiful that sex can be a doorway for that kind of healing and that kind of emotional expression. And then that it became even more passionate and loving because we were so connected to our hearts and I was connected to the preciousness of life. And then we brought that into the lovemaking. So all of it as a whole, that's incredible. Whereas for someone else who's thinking, okay, everybody's got to be happy or we've got to you know, keep going through because otherwise we might lose this opportunity. It becomes drier and less interesting and less varied and less passionate. Yeah. I mean, when, when sex was just a physical act for me, which was you know, for many years of my life, there was no real desire for connection or intimacy. Yeah. And if emotions came up, it, it was experienced as like a- This is in the way. This is a buzzkill. Yeah, yeah. This is yeah. the way, right? And the kind of sex- that I'm having now that the men in, that are listening to the show are having now is much more about intimacy and connection. And, and I will say that like that sex is oftentimes one of the most beautiful experiences to watch a woman open. Yes. And when she opens, 
that means oftentimes there are things that have been buried yeah. that are now coming to the surface. In your case, it was there was pain yeah. in that moment from the loss from earlier in that day. This is something that happened not that long ago in, in a partnership that I have right now, sexually speaking, where you know, she and I in the morning had a really rough conversation mm-hmm. that wasn't fully processed. It was going to take some time for that. That afternoon, we ended up sleeping together and it started off fine. And then I saw exactly like you said, like I saw something shift and I have the sense that if I had kept going, she would have gone with it. Yeah. That's often right? very true. Yeah. And I didn't, and I had, you know, and I, I stopped and I, and I asked her, I just said, Hey, like I noticed something, just like you said that your partner did, Anything, right? I I noticed something. I noticed your, your eyes look a little distant or you're right. Something just dulled or you, yeah, whatever it is, you can just notice. You can notice it. And, and which is why it's so important for eye contact. Like if, you know, and, and I've just learned by the way, that there are a number of people who either are autistic or have other you know issues where eye contact is very challenging. So I want to make sure that like, we're, we're including them in the conversation, but if you have the ability to make eye contact and it's, it's not a socially ang- anxious thing for you, it's imperative to be that tuned into your partner because In this case, what ended up happening was we did stop. The emotions did come to the surface. There were tears. And there was a clearing afterwards that allowed her to trust me. And I felt more connected to her. And just like you said, the sex was way better than what we were doing. Before that. Yeah, before that. Yeah. Yeah, And I was going to say too about the visual. I mean, visual is beautiful. And as we were talking about before, when you learn to feel more in your body and in your heart, you can also feel a person. You don't even necessarily have to be looking at them to know that something in the dynamic has shifted. Right on. That's great. Mm -hmm. What are other ways that you're seeing men abdicate leadership in the bedroom? And again, you know, how to, to step up and take back that role? Yeah. One of the things we were talking about before is that how many couples don't actually talk about sex outside of the bedroom. And so that's another place of leadership, which could be, okay, if you had your most ideal or amazing sex life, what would it look like? And if I had it, here's what it would look like. Having, you know, leading that conversation and getting clear about here's what we might want to try or what do we need? Instead of there's a problem again, you know, what might we need to get to that next level or to bring more spark or to feel more intimacy and connection with each other? That's a great place to take leadership. I love that one because- we had a guest on the show two years ago. His name is Dr. David Lay, mm-hmm. and he's a sex addiction therapist. Everyone needs a moment to laugh that a sex addiction therapist's last name is, is Lay. Lay. <laughs> uh, uh, and, and he had said that most men don't talk about sex when they're not in a state of turn on. Right. Right. And so like what we're talking about here is, is the man kind of taking the leadership to say like, what do we want our sex life to be? Yeah. There's an awesome guy in my mastermind. His name is Ryan. And he and his wife- have this annual tradition at the end of the year, they do a sex and strategy vacation together over the new year. Sex and And strategy, that's brilliant. Isn't it? So like 50% of their their time is spent on like strategizing what they want their family to look like over the next year. And then the other 50% is about their sex life, you know, for the next year. And when I heard that, I'm like, my gosh, that's, that's brilliant because- the prevailing belief with a lot of men is I shouldn't have to work. For right. the, I work everywhere else. My sex life is the one place where I get to lay it down. What would you say to that particular complaint, Shana? That's like, I work everywhere else. Why should I have to work in my sex life? <laughs> what would you say to that? Oh, <laughs> I'm, I'm pausing. There's this sense of A, that it has to be hard somehow. I love the question of like, how could this be easier? Or how could this be more enjoyable? You know? If having conversations or getting honest or real with something feels like work, then I would separate that from sex. Then there's there's something happening where either it's scary to be vulnerable or hmm. there's some kind of fear that it's not going to go well. There's something wrapped around that, right, hmm. that would be really good to look at because it doesn't have to be work, but I do think it takes some intention and some energy and some collaboration and co-creation to get everybody, you know, to a place that feels amazing. I love that. Yeah. I've had partners in the past where those kinds of conversations would have felt like work, Mm -hmm. partially because like my agenda, Uh partially because of my inability to communicate, but partially because 
she may not have been as open. Yeah. Sometimes it is pushing a boulder up a hill in, in some respects. But as I've learned how to drop my agenda, of course, there are things that I want, yep. but to make the invitation in a way that would appeal to her. Right. That's leadership. Which is le- exactly, which is leadership. Then these conversations now are exciting. Yes. Like I can't wait to have them. Really? You know? It's actually a turn on themselves, right? You can get turned totally. on just sitting there talking about this, not even touching each other. Yeah. That's another thing too, when you think about there's the energetic touch and there's physical touch, but it just reminded me, right, that you can sit and talk to each other. You can look into each other's eyes. You can breathe together while not even touching. All of these things can be orgasmic, can be exciting, can be intimacy building. I love all of that. And the the eye gazing, the New York Times had an article out about that years ago where it talked about how, like, if you want to fall in love with someone, do this for three minutes. Oh, right. It was the 36 questions. And then at the end, it was, okay, look into each other's eyes silently for three minutes. Yes. By the way, I wrote a part two of that. I have like another 36 questions for the advanced version that I've never really shared. But if you guys are interested, I'll... (laughs) I'll pass it on. How do we get that? I'll send you. Yeah, I'll send you a link to it. Okay. Yeah, send me the link. I'll put it in the show notes. That would be fun. That'd be really cool. So there you go, fellas. You know, here's one way to take back your leadership is by, you know, sitting down, maybe asking your partner these 36 questions. Right. And you can consummate that with a an eye gazing experience at the end of it. I love eye gazing. Here's what I would say, because a lot of men are like, oh, this is weird. <laughs> we, you can get to the point where you are actually like kind of welcome that awkwardness or that weirdness or the energy that comes to your body or the shame or the what you think people are thinking about you the more you can actually sit through that and welcome that and kind of bear it or tolerate it you digest a lot of that fear and awkwardness that keeps you from being able to relax in silence whether it's in a business meeting or whether it's in lovemaking is so powerful, you know, to really see that when you're sitting silently looking into someone's eyes, all the shit that's buzzing in there is buzzing pretty much constantly and impacting how you relate to people. So it really benefits people to work through that sense of, oh, this is really awkward. 100%. If you're able to stand eye to eye with someone and breathe them in, and even, you know, you can feel your feelings, but still maintain your stability and groundedness, then- like the other person can feel your strength and there's a trustworthiness. And then the step beyond this in terms of like what happens biochemically, yep. like I think after minute number two, oxytocin releases mm-hmm. in both people's bodies and oxytocin is the bonding agent. It's mm-hmm. the thing that nursing mothers experience with their babies, right? And that that closeness. So there's there's like chemistry happening here. So a simple exercise could just be sitting across from your partner for three minutes, gaze into their, the, the other person's eye, no touching. Mm-hmm. And just experience that. Shana, let's hit one more topic before we wrap this conversation that blew by. It was, it, this has been so much fun. And I've also gotten some coaching from you. So thank you for all of that. <laughs> My uh, pleasure. <laughs> is this conversation around vulnerability? Now, I've just posed this question to the Facebook group where the Great Man Within podcast discussions happen afterwards. Mm-hmm. You know, there's such an outcry for men to be more vulnerable. But I've also heard that a lot of men have been burned when they've opened up vulnerably, yep. you know, like, and, and I asked for men's stories and there was a few men who said, yeah, like I've been called weak. Mm-hmm. I've been told to be a man. Yeah. I've had sex withheld. Yeah. So you are passionate about talking about vulnerability as a strength and not a weakness. How can you guide men to navigate these waters of, okay, we're, we're being told we should be vulnerable, but I've been hurt for that in the past. Like, you know, what's the truth here? Yeah. Well, I would say go check out my TEDx talk, first of all, because I talk about that. It's it's really the focus. One of the pieces that I talk about in there is vulnerability from a place of recognizing, oh, this is a part of me. It's not all of me. And so when I or whoever's speaking, right, if you, a man listening, is sharing your vulnerability from a sense of hey, I'm a great man, the great man within. I can feel the great man within me. There are parts that I feel vulnerable or scared about and I can put them out there. If I'm not already holding that, that there's something wrong with me and a woman or anybody else responds and is like, oh, you're weak or this or that, it's going to sting, of course, right? It's not like it's going to feel good, but it's not going to cause you then to 
doubt yourself. Or if it does cause you to doubt yourself, it's in passing, right? It doesn't stick in the same way where you're like, wow, that's a confirmation that I must be a shitty guy or I must be weak or something. It's more like, ooh, yeah, that feels really old and familiar. And actually, I know who I am now. So I might need to go take a walk. I might need to go take some space, but I can actually still remember who I am. And then I can stand up to whoever that person is with love and say, I hear that. I hear what you're saying. And actually, I believe something different because I know that I'm strong and I know that it takes a lot for me to bring this level of vulnerability to you right now. And I believe that that actually makes me even stronger. Right. And to be able to do that, like the way that you just described it is there have to be some inner structures in place, right? Like you said, which is like the, to recognize, hey, I'm about to expose some tender parts of me and I recognize that I may be rejected mm -hmm. or I may be, right? And then like you said, to not experience that as a condemnation of my identity, right? But more of a, well, that was that person's reaction and I'm, I'm going to feel it because like, man, I mean, you know, that like that hurts and I'm human. Mm -hmm. How are you seeing guys building those inner structures so that like they can take that position? That's a great question. And the other thing I just wanted to say, I realized that I left out is that then you could stand up for yourself and say, here's how I really need you to respond to me right now. Or here's what I need from you right now. I need you to actually have some compassion or I need you to open up your ideas about what being manly actually is. There's a way that you can have both love and a spine in that moment. And so for, for building those structures and building a spine, I think the work that you're doing and having men come together and actually understand that they're not alone and there's not something wrong with them is huge. I think when I work with men and we have these, we go back to what are your actual desires and what, what really turns you on and excites you. And to get to a place where you recognize that even if someone else has something different, even if it's not a match, it doesn't make what you want or you feel wrong. Right. So ultimately getting to that place of learning to validate yourself through the support of others around you who see you and see deeper than you can see in yourself as you're learning to do so. That's beautiful. Thank you for that. And uh, I think if we can get more and more men comfortable with opening up, feeling strong, knowing how to communicate what it is that they need in those moments of vulnerability. Yeah. We become stronger men. We become more trustworthy men. We become closer to our intimate partners. And then we get to have more mind-blowing sex, yes. which, which is really, really all roads lead it is, to it's that. It's all right? connected. It's, it's all connected in that way. And it seems like the doorway to amazing sex is through sexual positions and all kinds of things. But when you really get back into, oh, the honesty, the vulnerability, the connection in these ways that seem disconnected from sex, that's another doorway into having better sex. No doubt. Well, Shana, this has been a really fun, fast moving, funny conversation. And <laughs> if there's someone who's listening now, who's like, wow, I'm really resonating with Shana. I could, I could use the work. Like, what does your coaching look like? And then what's the best way for them to reach you? Yeah. My coaching, it's different. I would say it's unique for every man based on what he needs. But in general, we get together and we look at what are you struggling with and what's in the way. And then we do a couple different things. We practice and play with you either going out into the world and doing some of those things that you feel scared of in a step-by-step -step way. Mm. And then coming back and debriefing and seeing mm. where you got stuck and what was challenging or we do some role playing. I don't role play like as somebody else, but I really work with men to create connection and spark and depth mm. through conversation, through silence, through, like we said, eye gazing, all of that. So I know there's a bunch of different ways that we play with it and basically make it so that it's less serious and hard and work and yeah. more exciting and interesting and playful. Yeah. I really like the part about what are the areas that are of struggle, go out, there's an assignment, take action, come back, let's debrief it. Because that's the thing that's missing from a lot of men's lives who don't have a coach or some support. It's kind of like, I go out and I try shit and then I come back and I, I get in my own head, in my own way, and I process it from a, an unpracticed place. So that feels really good. 
is the best way for them to find you through, is it shanajames.com? Mm, shanajamescoaching.com. And Shana is S-H-A-N-A. And I was just going to say too, right? If you're trying things, we all have our blind spots. And so to sit across from someone, right, whether it's you or me or someone else, I'm not attached that it's me, but someone who can see you and call out and say, well, you know, in that moment, your energy went up or your energy went down, or it seemed like you got a little scared there. What really happened? And to unpack all of that invisible, I talk about the invisible influences as one of my courses. And so to really start to look at what's happening below the surface, that's not necessarily the words you're using or the action you're taking, but everything else that's below the iceberg, right? Below the visible line of the iceberg. Oh, I love that. Yeah. The invisible influences. So I'm going to link all these in the show notes, shanajamescoaching.com. We got your TEDx talk. We're going to link uh, the Man Alive podcast. I think there's a few other things I've written down, but you can count on those three being there. Awesome. Oh, and hopefully your 36 questions, if yes. you can send those over advanced as well, that'd be great. <laughs> excuse, excuse me. These 36 hoity-toity <laughs> advanced questions, we'll make sure if you can send those over, those will be in the, in the show notes. Thank you so much for this awesome, refreshing conversation and also for the work that you're doing in the men, for the men in the world because- Obviously, like this is where I've built my entire life around. And I know there's so many guys out there who need support from all the different angles. And it's nice to know that like you're in the foxhole with us. Thank you. And thank you for doing the work with men and really for your willingness to be vulnerable and talk about your own challenges and struggles. It makes a huge difference for all of us to then have someone who goes first that we can then realize oh, well, he's still alive and he's pretty <laughs> awesome and he's a kick-ass man or a woman, and, you know, right? You know what I mean? Whoever the person is, right? So yeah. thank you for going first. Thank you, Shana. All right, gentlemen, it is time to take action. What is the one thing that you are going to put into practice in your sex, love, intimate, dating life that you learned today from our conversation with Shana James? If you want more discussion about this, head over to the Great Man Within Facebook group. Share the thing, the insight, the takeaway, the action step that you're going to be taking. Call other men forward to take action in their lives. And we'll see you in the Facebook group, the Great Man Within Podcast, for further discussion.